Today is the day that millions of Americans will fulfill the most solemn responsibility of free men and women, the responsibility to blindly cast their votes without having the slightest idea what the hell is going on. This is the day when we cherish the freedom to vote, whether we're male or female, white or black, alive or a Democrat, in order to ensure that the best and brightest from among our nation get nowhere near the levers of government, because when clowns and lunkheads are running things, it's just more amusing. Today, every American can stand tall in awe at the majesty of the peaceful transition of power from whatever idiot has it now to whatever fool has been willing to lie and cheat to get his hands on it. Today, we put our most deeply held principles into action and cast our votes so that our chosen leaders can begin the daunting task of raising money for their next campaign. In each and every hamlet and town, Americans know in their heart of hearts that soon either a Democrat will ascend to high office and begin screwing everything up for decades, or a Republican will take the reins and be crapped on by the media for the rest of his natural life. For myself, I can barely watch this profound spectacle of human liberty without thinking to myself, I wonder what else is on, and will there be a nude scene? And if so, how many times can I watch it before my wife comes in and tells me to knock it off? This, after all, is what so many of our good and brave soldiers have fought for. Not the nude scene, I mean, but our right to vote in an election, although the nude scene is also terrific. Today is election day. And only one thing is certain, when it's over, we'll all be able to say that we have reached a new level of mutual hatred and hostility. And isn't that what this country is all about? Trigger warning, I'm Andrew Clavin, and this is The Andrew Clavin Show. I feel hunky-dunky, life is tickety-boo. Birds are winging, also singing, hunky dunky Ship-shaped, ipsy-topsy, the world is zippity-zing. It's a wonderful day, hooray, hooray, it makes me want to sing. To sing. Oh, hurrah, hooray, oh, hooray, hooray. All right, it is in fact election day, and we've got the latest exit polls that show that uh, John Kerry has got this thing wrapped up. And maybe those aren't the latest polls. But uh, in fact, we know not, absolutely nothing. And that's what we're going to talk about for the next 45 minutes. Absolutely nothing, which is what we know. Uh, first, we should talk about Grove Collaborative because, you know, the holidays are coming. And you know what that means. That's right. Your kids are going to make a mess. People are going to be coming into your house. A place is just going to look awful and disgusting, start, start to smell bad. And that is why you need the stuff that Grove Collaborative sells. It is all natural and it cleans the house terrifically and leaves what they call Mrs. Meyer's holiday scents. You can get Mrs. Meyer's exclusive offer from Grove before it runs out and select your favorite holiday scents like Iowa pine, peppermint, orange clove. And this is for a healthy home. You know, it's an all natural stuff that you can actually clean with and it actually works. New customers will get the holiday set when you place your first order of 20 bucks. That means free Mrs. Meyer's holiday hand soap, dish soap, multi-surface spray, Red Cleaning Caddy, Grove Collaborative Walnut Scrubber Sponges, and if you spend more than 39 bucks, you'll also receive a free Grove Stoneware Tray to beautifully display your new holiday soaps. Shop Grove before this exclusive holiday offer runs out. This stuff will be all gone come December. For a limited period of time, my listeners who sign up get amazing free Mrs. Meyers holiday product, a free 60-day VIP membership and a surprise bonus gift just for you when you sign up and place an order of 20 bucks or more. Check out Grove and our special offer at grove.co slash Clavin. That's grove.co, not com, grove.co slash Clavin. And when your house is beautiful, you'll look at it and say, oh my goodness, how do you spell Clavin? It's K-L-A-V-A-N. All right, here we go into the fray. May Phobes Day, as our Lord and Savior used to say, may, may for best name means do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. That's all they try to sell you is they're always telling you, oh, this is it. The country is on the line. They want you to get out and vote. And of course, of course, you should get out and vote. Vote for the right folks. Vote for the Republicans because Trump is going to need all the help he gets. And you know what's going to happen if he doesn't win it. But do not be afraid. The country is not on the line. You know, whenever, whenever we come into these moments of high tension, especially about politics in the country, I always like to go back to the source, back to the founders, to remind myself of what we're doing here, what it is that's important, what matters. Because when you know, when you go back to the founders, it's not as cut and dried as you think it is. There were arguments back then between what we'd, we would call liberals now, how much government there should be, how central the government should be, how local it should be. And those, gov those ideas were going back and forth. And when they, had, we, when they came out of the Revolutionary War and the 
states had bound together, because remember when they first came here, the states were their countries. You were not from the United States. There were no United States. You were from New York. You were from Georgia. You were from Vermont, where, wherever. That was your country. And people didn't want a big central government telling them what to do in their country. It would be just like having the UN today come in and tell us what to do here. But after the war, they found out that their, their bind, the bind, the rules they had made to bind themselves together, the Articles of Confederation, weren't enough. They started to have a, they needed a new, more powerful central government, and they wrote the Constitution. And then they had to sell it to the country. And that's why they wrote the Federalist Papers. The Federalist Papers were Alexander Hamilton and John Jay and James Madison selling the Constitution to people and saying, don't worry, you'll still have your states, but you do need a central government for these reasons. And then they laid out the reasons. And in fact, they called it, just calling it the Federalist Papers was kind of an act of propaganda because it was a way of saying, we'll still be a federation, we'll still be a, a league of individual states. So I went back to the Federalist Papers uh, for, the, for the, actually for the last couple of weeks, I've been rereading the Federalist Papers because they're so brilliant. And they remind you what they were doing here. They were inventing something that had never existed on earth before, from the very beginning of humanity to that moment in the 1780s, this was a new thing that was happening. And they realized that what they were doing on this continent, they were doing for the whole world. They were doing so the world could see that they could put together a government in which men could be free and yet there could be uh, a reasoned government. And, and everybody, they knew that what they were doing was going to be immortal. They knew that it, everyone was watching. And in the first Federalist paper, Federalist One, Alexander Hamilton, very short quote, he wrote, it has been frequently remarked that it seems to have been reserved to the people of this country by their conduct and example to decide the important question of whether societies of men are really capable or not of establishing good government from reflection and choice, or whether they are forever destined to depend for their political constitutions on accident and force. If there be any truth in the remark, the crisis at which we are arrived may with propriety be regarded as the era in which that decision is to be made, and a wrong election of the part we shall act may, in this view, deserve to be considered as the general misfortune of mankind. In other words, if we fail here, mankind, in some sense, has experienced that failure. This election today is not that election. The world is not going to live or die on what we do, and the republic is not going to live or die on what we do. But it is still the case, it is still the case that we are the political light of the world. We are the place that people turn. You know, because we, because they won that vote, because they established a constitution, the idea of a democratic republic became the ideal throughout the world. When we did that, when America, the Americans did that, there, was, there were no political republics. There were no democratic republics on the face of the earth. Today, everybody emulates that. Everybody emulates the idea of being a multicultural society. You hear people in Europe saying, well, we're a multicultural society. No, they're not. They are imitating that. They, you know, the, the, the French were the French. They were the Franks. The English were the Angles. They, they were, every other country on earth was a collection of race-tied race people, a family affair. Only this country was based on an idea, and that changed the world. Okay, That election for that constitution changed everything. It set up the idea of a republic when the Soviet Union, a slave state, came together. They called it the Soviet Union because it was the union of so Soviet socialist republics. They had to pretend that they were republics because we were so successful. This election is not that election. We are not depending the fate of the world. But, but what we do here, what we do here and whether we succeed here, still is the basis of what happens in the world. The world is still watching this country to know where to go next, to know what can be done, they laugh at us, they mock us, they say, oh, we do this, we're cowboys, we, we don't have the same kind of social spending that they have. They, all of them, depend on us. We defend them. There's not a free man walking the state, walking the face of the earth who is not free because of something this country did, whether it was win a war or just hold out against the Soviet Union. Every free man owes this country a, a debt, and that is why what we do actually matters. When I tell you not to be afraid, when I tell you not to panic, you know, it's like the, the hitchhiker's guy, don't panic. It's because I, I've been around a long time and I've seen a lot of stuff and I listen to these people on television, people who, men who are capable of tying their own ties and putting on suits, women who are capable of doing their makeup and sitting in front of a camera and talking, saying this crazy stuff, this crazy stuff. Like I've, I've heard people say, this is country is more divided than at any time since the Civil War. 
This country is more divided at any time since the Civil War. You know, this it's going to be an outbreak. We're going to tear ourselves apart. This is the end of the Republic. If it goes this way, if it goes that way. You know, I, I, I used to do a character I called Grandpa's Nick Fuddy Dud. You know, he would say, when I was a boy, you know, I remember when this and that. But, and I don't want to sound like that guy and say, when I was a boy, you know, I had to walk five miles through the snow to get to school. But when I was a boy, not only did I have to walk five miles through the snow to get to school, but the president of the United States was murdered. And then his brother ran for president, and he was murdered. A, a major civil rights leader rose up, and he was murdered. The universities were on fire. Children, when I say children, I mean university students, were being killed by our own forces, by our own National Guardsmen, by police officers. They were gassed. They fell off buildings to their deaths. And the National Guardsmen weren't entirely in the wrong. That's the worst thing about it. This country has been much more divided within this, the guy you're looking at, within my lifetime. It has been much more divided. It has been much more in trouble. What we are seeing right now is kind of America. It's crazy. It's chaotic. It's America. What, what's going to happen? I don't know. The best prediction I know always comes from Henry Olson. He says we're going to lose 30 seats in the House. We're going to lose the House, but uh, just barely managed to hold on to the Senate. The other side to that is this Rasmussen generic poll, which basically now has the Democrats and the Republicans tied in the generic poll, which is amazing. If that holds true, then there's reason to think there'll be a red wave, which would be shocking. But whatever happens, if there's a red wave, that will be a confirmation that Donald Trump is doing something right, that people have seen the economy, they like it. If we lose the Senate, if we hold the Senate and we lose the House, uh, that, like I said, that's the map. That's just the map. That just means that things haven't changed very much. People have looked at the economy, they love the economy, but they're still so divided and so angry at one another over social issues and Trump's tone and all that, that they will not come around. And so they've just voted the map. That would be what you would typically expect. If there is a blue wave, then Trump's going to have to recalibrate. He's going to have to come to the table. He's always been willing to negotiate. There's going to be a mess because of because it, it, the Democrats will not be able to convince themselves that it was just the map. They'll think that, oh, we've won and where the resistance has worked and they will act accordingly. But you, it's so important that you maintain a sense of reality, okay? It's so important that you maintain your inner self in keeping with what is going on outside. The country is doing well. The country is prosperous. The country is largely at peace. We're still fighting some of these stupid wars like in Afghanistan. I, you know, I don't know why we're still there, but we are. But we're, we're not fighting any major wars. We've rearranged, Trump has rearranged our foreign policy that it makes sense so our friends in Israel can count on us again and our friends around the world can count on us again. All those things are good things. The judges that he's appointed, appointed we, those things will remain. They're going to stay the same and we don't have to be afraid. First, I'm going to talk about some of the stuff that's being said because it is amazing. Uh, but first, I got to talk about stamps.com. You got to get stamps.com because we love the post office. It does so much for us. We still need it so much. But like everybody, everything else that you have, you want it in your computer and you want to be able to do it when you do it. I live in L.A. I cannot get into a car without expecting to drive for 30 minutes, three miles, 30 minutes, four, four or five miles, 30 minutes. Whatever it is, is always 30 minutes. I just can't do it. I want my post office in my computer. With Stamps.com, you can access all the amazing services of the post office right from your desk 24-7 when it's convenient for you. Buy and print official U.S. postage for any letter, any package using your own computer and printer, and the mail carrier just picks it up. It is terrific, and it's fun, too. Right now, use Clavin for this special offer. It includes up to 55 bucks free postage, a digital scale, and a four-week trial. Don't wait. Go to Stamps.com before you do anything else. Click on the radio microphone at the top of the homepage and type in Clavin, K-L-A-V-A-N. That's Stamps.com, and enter Clavin, K-L-A-B-A-N. That reminds me, I didn't mention it's the mailbag tomorrow, isn't it? We'll probably even, the country will still be here, so we'll still have to have a mailbag. Send in your questions. You know how to do it. Go to dailywire.com, subscribe. You got to subscribe because you get everything, right? You get the Another Kingdom. You get the, for a hundred bucks, you get the whole year and you get the Leftist Tears Tumblr. You get the mailbag and in the mailbag, you get to ask all your questions about whatever you want. And the answers are guaranteed 100% correct and will change your life, sometimes even for the better, occasionally. Go to dailywire.com, hit the podcast button, hit the Andrew Claven podcast, hit the little mailbag, and send in your questions. We will do them tomorrow if the country is still standing. Um, you know, the, th the thing is, when you're looking at an election, 
you're doing what you always have to do in life, which is you're trying to figure out, you're trying to arrange your inner life with the outer world. That's the whole secret to life. Most people are living in their imaginations. Most people are not telling themselves the truth. Why? Because they want to feel more important. They want to feel better than they are. They're telling themselves lies about themselves. But you want to see the whole picture. And the whole picture is hard to see because, first of all, you're a little person. You haven't gotten, all of us are small. We don't have the big um, canvas in front of us. And we fill things in. You know, the scientists will tell you that your eye has blind spots in it, but your brain fills in those blind spots because it knows what's supposed to be there. Well, our imaginations do the same thing. We don't know what people are thinking. We don't know what, what the country is doing. We don't know what the world is doing. Our imagination fills that in. Our imagination is keyed into our feelings, and people are trying to manipulate your feelings all the time. So it's very easy to get confused. And that's what I see when I look at the media today. What I see is the media trying to manipulate our emotions. And it is, to, to me, it's the biggest problem this country has. The debt, maybe, maybe it's up there, but really this the fact that 8% of the country, uh, the radical left, is governing 85% of the communication industry, which is the news business, the, the academy, and Hollywood, and trying to mess with your mind. So all you hear, all you have hear, heard is that Trump in talking a lot in his closing arguments for this election, has been talking a lot about the border. And uh, Cassie Dillon was down at the border, and we're going to have her on uh, later on in the show to tell us what she saw. But they keep accusing Trump of spreading fear. He's spreading fear. All he does is spread fear. In the, in the front page of the uh, electronic New York Times, a former newspaper, they had, you know, Trump ends the campaign spreading fear and hatred. So Grabian, our friends at Grabian, who make up these wonderful... Um, these wonderful montages, put together a montage of the media telling you that Trump is spreading fear, followed by the way the media has been talking. Let's compare. This is really interesting. They are actively yes. engaging in the fear mongering and the lying and the hatred and the racism. Donald Trump and his erratic behavior could be leading the United States towards World War III, could be leading America towards a nuclear war. You know, we had the nuclear clock uh, when we were all growing up. It, it's probably closer to, to midnight, Mike Barnacle, than any time it's been since the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, the, the president and his team are trying to drive up fear and rage uh, when it comes to these migrants coming up from Central America towards the U.S. border with Mexico. Let's turn to North Korea. Uh, I mean, it is building up to this sort of doomsday nightmare scenario. The president has fully embraced a dark anti-immigrant message in the hope that stoking fear will motivate voters to reject Democrats. We're going to have either a hunt in the next three years or we're going to have the Romanovs. It's the amazing power to destroy this planet that's in the finger of a president of the United States. With president Trump holding rallies all over the country, sinking to new lows with his lying and fear mongering. He sounds deeply troubled. He sounds unhinged. This is why questions about his fitness for office are so urgent. This is the biggest story that I see happening right now. So what they are trying to do, what they're trying to do is they're trying to affect your imagination because your imagination fills in the parts of the world that you don't know about. And your job is to keep your imagination in tune with reality. It is not, it is not to say that your uh, imagination you know, your imagination is not sound. It is to say that it is easily manipulated by both sides. The problem is it is the left that owns all of the communication industry, and they are selling this kind of, uh, this kind of craziness. This is why, by the way, this is why the left, when they speak, they are, everything they say is so foolish and small because they have taught themselves using their imaginations that they are virtuous, and they do that by cutting out the rest of the world by cutting out actually the way the world works. You ever meet a pacifist, a guy who says, oh, I'm a pacifist? And you think, well, are you a pacifist? Because if you were actually a pacifist, a guy who wouldn't fight under any circumstances, wouldn't you be dead by now? Except for the fact that you're surrounded by people who do those jobs for you, the police and the military. The police and the military are willing to fight to keep you alive. So you're not really a pacifist. You've just deputized other people to do the violence for you by, by excising those people from your imagination it makes you feel safe. That is why Americans who feel so safe and have been so safe for so long say such stupid stuff like, oh, all cultures need to be respected. Are you joking? 
Are you joking? All cultures don't need to re- be respected, but they just have ex- because we're so safe so surrounded by good police officers and good military people who, who will defend our rights, we excise those people from our imaginations and we think, oh, you know, this is a wonderful world. It's so peaceful. It's so lovely. It's so nice. That is the, what the Democrats have been selling when they sell you universal health care, like other, and they say, well, other, you know, like Bernie Sanders, you know, I personally believe, I personally believe, I happen to believe that every country should have health care. And you think, well, yeah, they don't have health care. We pay for their health care by paying more for medicine and by uh, paying for their military and pay all the things that we do that they don't do for themselves. They cut that stuff out. So you listen to them and you listen to what they're saying. And the virtue signaling is all based on imaginations that have excised the rest of the world. This Googleized Cortez woman, Ocasio Cortez, who keeps saying all the stuff we should have. And you ask her, like, how do you pay, how do you pay for this stuff? She has just excised that part, portion of reality out of her head. And this is what the media does. So let, I just listen to this wonderful clip. She's on with that guy. What's his name? Ramos? Is that his name? Uh, uh, and he actually asks her, how are you going to pay for this? Medicare for all. Mm-hmm. Is it too expensive? No. People often say, like, how are you going to pay for it? And I find the question so puzzling because... How do you pay for something that's more affordable? How do you pay for cheaper rent? How do you pay for, you just pay for it. <laughs> we're paying more now. So it's not that our, that we're saying this whole system is free. Yeah. It's saying it is free of cost at the point of service. So that means that you're not delaying going to the dentist. Because you're not, you money. because yeah. you don't have the cash at the point of service. Number nine, tuition free public universities for mm-hmm. all. Who will pay for that? So we already pay for tuition free K through 12. And in the same way that we made a decision as a country to say, we need to educate people to a 12th grade level, our economy has evolved, and that means we need to make the decision to educate people to a trade school or collegiate level. So when you cut, you know, it's nonsense. I, I get so puzzled when people ask me, how are you gonna pay for this? How are you gonna pay? And she thinks it's going to be cheaper because she's thinking of all of America's money as one big pool of money. But of course, it's not. It's money that individuals have earned. And some individuals have earned more of it than others. And some have just got more of it than others through luck or birth or whatever. It doesn't belong to her. By cutting that out, the fact that she's stealing from people at gunpoint, she cuts that out of her imagination. So she doesn't have a real sense. Why do you want your imagination to be as big as it can possibly be so you understand the ramifications of what you're talking about? This small-mindedness on the left the small mindedness on the left is wh- how they have convinced themselves is how they have convinced themselves that everybody on the right is a bad person. You know, Paul Krugman wrote this piece, unbelievable piece in the New York Times on Knucklehead Row in the op ed section. Paul Krugman writes, it is now impossible. It's impossible. Just it, this is impossible. It's impossible to have intellectual integrity and a conscience while remaining a Republican in good standing. This is, this, is, this is the problem that you get if you read the knucklehead row on the New York Times. Some conservatives have these qualities. Almost all of them have left the party or are on the edge of excommunication. In other words, if you do not agree with Paul Krugman, you can't have a conscience. You're, not, you're, not a, you're a person without a conscience. Those who remain in the Republican Party are either fanatics, like you, willing to do any, and me, willing to do anything in pursuit of power, or cynics willing to go along with anything for a share of the spoils. And it's foolish to imagine that there are any limits on how far a party of fanatics and cynics will be willing to go. Anyone who might have had a sticking point, some uncrossable red line of bad behavior, has already taken the off-ramp and left the party. That is what they think of you. That is what they think of anybody who votes for Donald Trump. He's a madman, and therefore, you know, you must be a madman. And there's nothing, there's nothing you're not willing to do. So if there's nothing they're not willing, you're not willing to do, there's nothing they won't do to stop you. You want to hear this in a clip, Mika Brzezinski, who seriously must have forgotten to take the pill this morning, that the, her, her mental pill that keeps her sane, because she just flipped out. I mean, this is nuts, but it's just the way they are thinking about you because they have not got a full perception of reality. Listen to Mika Brzezinski. The rhetoric of this racist, heartless, soulless man will lead to more violence. Yes, I said that, and a lot of Americans believe it too. They see what is happening to our country. This is a so-called leader with no shame. He doesn't care. He's got no sense of decency, no sense of duty, and no limits, and this is important for everyone to understand, no limits 
of what he's capable of doing to stave off any humiliation for himself, the humiliation that his desperate actions suggest, is that he knows what's coming next Tuesday. It could be bad for him. There could be subpoena power. There could be impeachment. He knows he's on the line and he will do anything to save himself. <laughs> he will do all imagination, right? He will do anything to save himself. Will he mobilize the army against you? Will it, you know, let me give you my theory of Donald Trump. I'm going to give you my theory of Donald Trump. Because 8% of the country dominates 85% and I'm making that number up, but it feels like they own 85% of the communications industry, the academy, Hollywood, and the news business. Because of that, they have, they have done this to themselves. They have convinced themselves that you can't have a conscience and be a Republican, and that you're willing to do anything, anything, and there's going to be violence. He says he's a soulless man. Trump doesn't even have a soul. He's a, this is a soulless hunk of zombie flesh who has taken over the White House. They have convinced themselves that this is the world. And because they've convinced themselves that this is the world, they can say anything about us that they want, and they have. And they've created this world in which all of our opinions are not just wrong, which is fine, they, they're welcome to disagree with us, but they're evil, right? They're, they're racist. They have that thing, the dog whistle. You don't know you're a racist, but I know you're a racist because when you say X, it really means Y. I mean, it's a nutty Orwellian way of thinking, but it's the way they think, and it's been going on for years and years. And finally, finally, the people of this country got angry enough to send a guy who was willing to be called those things, racist, homophobic, sexist, Islamophobic. He was willing to be called those things. They bounce off him. They just bounce off him like he's wearing you know, armor. He doesn't care. A guy like that, you know, when you outlaw speech, which is essentially what they've done, only outlaws will speak. And a guy like that is going to be an outlaw. He's going to be a strong man. He's going to be a different kind of person. He's going to be, I always hate this uh, phrase, the alpha male, because it's uh, redolent of apes. And I don't think we are apes. Uh, you know, I think we may share ancestors with the apes, but we're not apes. But it's still, it's the strong man. Let's call him the strong man. It takes a strong man. It takes a rude, boorish, big personality to stand up against the kind of rhetoric these guys have been dealing out to the rest of the country for all this time. Now, Americans don't react well to strong men because we are a liberty-loving people and we know that strong men take up too much space and do bad things. We're used to strong men in government being tyrants. And that that's, goes back into time, you know? I mean, there's a, an evolutionary theory that strong men dominated human tribes, just like they dominated ape tribes, until we developed language and spears and weapons. And then people started talking to each other and said, you know what, if we get together and we all have spears, we can take this strong man and chase him out of town. If we don't kill him, you know, we can just get rid of him. And that's where they, they theorize that that's where ideas of liberty and equality come from, from that, from banding together as a band of brothers in order to chase the strong man out of town. When we see a strong man, some light goes off in our heads and we become wary, we become afraid. We say to ourselves, you know what, we got to watch this guy. He may be a tyrant. Trump could have been a tyrant before we voted for him. I thought, yeah, I said, there's a 5% chance this guy is a tyrant, but he's not. He's just not. Nothing he's done has been tyrannical. He hasn't silenced speech. Twitter silences speech. Google, Facebook, they silence speech. They are tyrannical. Donald Trump is not. He hasn't violated the constitution by, say, using the IRS to silence his political opponents. Obama did that. Donald Trump hasn't. He hasn't done, whenever somebody tells him that something is unconstitutional, if they have authority, he stops. He'll put, sign an executive order. A court will say, nope, you can't do that. He does something else. He tries again. He is constantly, when he's talking about the border, he's constantly said to the Congress, pass laws. I'm not going to do it. It's Chuck, it's Chuck Schumer who waved the pen at him and said, no, you do it with your pen, your highness. It's, it, Trump won't do it. Trump looks like a tyrant. He sets off some atavistic light bulbs in some people's heads that say, oh my gosh, he's a tyrant. But he's not a tyrant. He is not a tyrant. And so we have this, this world in which they're acting like children in an imaginary world. They're acting in the, their imaginations. And we have to try and bring them back to reality. But the thing is, and this is true, whatever happens today, whatever happens in the election today, we lose some seats, we lose the House. Even if we lose the House and the Senate, which I don't think is going to happen, but even if that happens, in the aftermath, when the smoke clears, there will be a political adjustment to whatever has happened, and we will go back to being a fractious, noisy, chaotic, 
revolutionary country, we will still be America. We will still be the last best hope of people, of the last best hope of man on earth. We will still be the light, the political light of the world. We will still be the country that everybody turns to to find out what is going to happen next. We are still what we have always been. We are still the freest, best country that God has ever made. It's going to be this way tomorrow, no matter who wins. So go out and vote. Fight your corner. Keep fighting your corner. But may fobeste. Do not be afraid. Hey, tonight, we starting at 5 p.m. Pacific, the Daily Wire backstage election special will be on. The Daily Wire God King, Jeremy Boring, and he is, guys, you got to fix this co- copy because Jer- Jeremy himself is going to get nervous if we just start pointing him to God King. He's the Daily Wire God King, Jeremy Boring, will be there. Mr. Sh- Monsieur Shapiro will be there. Michael Knowles, freshly back on Twitter after having been banned, as he well and certainly should have been, will be with us. And of course, the lovely Alicia Krauss and I myself will be covering all the latest election news as it happens. And we'll even be getting Twitter updates from our own Cassie Dillon and Colton Haas. So you won't want to miss this. As always, only Daily Wire subscribers get to ask the questions like, what's going to happen now? We don't know. That'll save you that one right there. So make sure to subscribe today so you can be asked questions during today's election special and also tomorrow in the mailbag. Cassie Dillon is going to come on and tell us about her trip to the border in just a moment. But first, I got to say goodbye to Facebook and YouTube. Come to dailywire.com and subscribe. Ask your questions for tomorrow's mailbag, and I I will give you my answers 100% guaranteed, 100% correct, and guaranteed also to change your life, sometimes for the better. Come on over. This wall, built in 1991, is made out of leftover helicopter landing masts from the Vietnam War. So this was in Vietnam? Yes, this was what they used to land on the rice paddies. I'm not an athletic person, but I think I can handle this. For 30 years, this has helped us secure this border. Stopping mainly vehicles. Absolutely. Well, it's time to be upgraded, I think. <laughs> I, I, I agree. So Donald Trump used this caravan that seems to be moving up from from Honduras through Mexico to our border. He's used this as kind of his closing argument. This is what the Democrats want. This is what they're going to allow to happen. The Democrats' argument was, why is he complaining about somebody when they're a thousand miles away as if that were going to take them forever? Like, that's oh, that's never going to happen. We shouldn't think about that. But they are coming this way. I think that what Trump is is betting on is he's betting that some of the suburban women who don't who are worried about health care and are therefore susceptible to Democrat arguments might come around if because this is important to them too. Their safety and security is important to them too. And so this might be an argument that might reach them. So to find out what whether Trump has any case to make, you know, we sent Cassie Dillon down to the wall because none of the men had the guts to go down there. They were afraid of getting hurt. So we sent a five foot two woman who she must weigh, what, 90 pounds? Is the founder of the website, Lone Conservative. She's also contributed to the Wall Street Journal Campus Reform in the Hill. And she is, of course, our own Cassie Dillon, the staff writer here at The Daily Wire. You made this video that we just watched a little bit of. I mean, it kind of, what struck me about it is how logical it just seemed that we need a wall. Basically, I mean, is that what you is that what you found? Well, originally, before I went down there, I wasn't the biggest proponent of the wall. I thought it was expensive. I didn't know if it'd be effective. But going down there and speaking to Border Patrol, which you know, that's what we should be doing in the first place. We're not experts here in Massachusetts, New York, DC. We don't know what's going down going on down there. So I talked to Border Patrol, and you know, I really do think that something needs to be built because right now, what we have is Vietnam landing mats. What helicopters use? It's embarrassing. They're rusty. They're gross. And right now, they're replacing it with an 18 foot see through fence, which I wasn't really a big fan of the see-through fence before going down there as well because it keeps Border Patrol safe because they can see what's going on. Because they do get assaulted. That's one thing they said to me I didn't think of. They do get assaulted. They have weapons used towards them. They get rocks thrown at them. And more than 150 Border Patrol agents get assaulted every year. So it it does happen. So I think after going down there, I have concluded that we do need something. I don't know if we need the 30-foot wall, but I do like the 18-foot barrier. It's cost effective and it, it's working. Now, they keep accusing Trump of fear mongering when he says there are criminals and, and maybe terrorists in these groups. What did the Border Patrol tell you? They said that they see cartels and they see families coming across. And the problem with the families is they're being smuggled by the cartels. The cartels <laughs> are the people who smuggle them across. And if somebody in the family gets hurt or they just can't keep up, they'll leave them there to die. 
Border Patrol gives these people, you know, medical aid and all of that when they get caught coming over. So yeah. it's a dangerous situation all the way around. And I think going through the legal methods of getting of immigrating is a better option. It's safer. Well, of course it's safer. But but she said to you in, in this video, she says the cartels run this territory. I mean, the cartels, when we're talking about the cartels, we're talking about major drug yes. gangster operations run by guys like Al Pacino, except not actors, right? They're killing people. They, these are people who own Mexico as a criminal these are criminal enterprises. And they run, these guys, these coyotes are not independent contractors, right? No, they run the border. If you are a coyote and you're trying to smuggle somebody across and you're not in your territory, you just stepped on another cartel's toe and you are going to have repercussions. So they do, they, they section this off in territory and it's a, they make a ton of money smuggling people in. Mm. And it's not just Mexicans getting smuggled in. They have a whole classification called OTM, other than Mexican. And she's, she was saying that they find Haitians and South Asians and Middle Easterners and all these different nationalities and a lot of Central Americans as well and a lot of South Americans. So it's not just Mexicans coming in. It's it's a bunch of people and they make a lot of money off of it. So they do find Middle Easterners? Yeah, they do. I mean, that's that's nerve wracking. That's nervous making, right? Yeah. I, mean, yeah. I was interviewing some uh, sheriffs in Arizona who also patrol the border and they were telling us that they actually caught some people who were affiliated with Al-Qaeda a few years ago. And they really? had it confirmed by the Department of Homeland Security that they were affiliated with Al-Qaeda. I mean, that, that, is, that is genuinely terrifying. And it really means that Trump is basically just talking common sense. I, I agree. I think that, you know, it is a really big border. I'm not sure if we need barriers everywhere because there's some parts sure. where people just can't go. Okay. If you go there, you will die. There's no water. You'll need a lot of gear to get over there. But I think especially in San Diego, they said that 130 people cross a day Getting caught. San Diego. A day caught. Wow. That doesn't even account for the people who cross and are not detected. So I think that it makes sense having these high population areas to have something there. And so 130 people, this is just in San Diego. Just in San area. Diego. And 130 people caught a day. So we can assume some people don't get caught probably. And then what what happens when these border patrol people capture them? They get caught, they're they are up in, they're into their jail facilities up to 72 hours, and then they get processed over dice. Okay, so so they send them to ICE, and ICE has to put them through what? They they can't just send them right back, right? I guess they have legal proceedings That's and bureaucracy, it. and then they get sent over. So, so now you're looking at this, and you're talking to Border Patrol. What do they tell you about their experience on the, on a given day? I mean, what is what is it like being out there? Well, first, Border Patrol is made up of they said up to fifty percent is Hispanic. So it's not this white or racist right, organization right, like we okay. hear that, you know, there's Hispanic border patrol agents. And then also I 50% thought 50% is up to 50%. 50%. And so okay. also she, the woman in the video, her name is TK Michael. And she told me that also five, only 5% of border patrol are female. And I was wondering, well, why is that? That's kind of low. And then later on, she told me that they're in remote areas all day. Her office is the outdoors and, uh -huh. you know, they're also out by themselves. They don't have partners. And so she told me later on that the reason why it's only 5% women is because there's no bathrooms. <laughs> so, you know, you have issues. You like, it's not you can't sexist. have women without bathrooms. That's right. <laughs> exactly. So she said that you can be in remote areas by yourselves and you can have different things happen. And, you know, what are you going to do? She said in the 80s that there wasn't enough border patrol to stop these crossings. You'd have 100 people crossing at a time because there were no barriers at all. Right. Crossing with vehicles. And what are you going to do? One border patrol agent's going to stop 100 people from crossing? Yeah, right. So that's why that weird Vietnam border did kind of work for stopping vehicles, but not for stopping people. I mean, in the video, the border, the, the one they've got up now, that was the old Vietnam thing, it just looks like a, basically a, a kind of uh, like a tin roof almost. It's nothing. It's, I, you could drive a truck through it probably. I touched it and thought I was going to need a tetanus shot. This thing is very, very bad. <laughs> yeah. And like I said in the video, I'm not an athletic person, but I could probably climb that very easily. You could go over it and there were all these cuts in it? I mean, Oh, yeah. There, so they said that some of the cuts Border Patrol put in, you can see like they're, they're more formed because they wanted to see what's going on on the other side. Right. But a lot of them have been you know, crossed through. And this also doesn't go underground. The prototypes that President Trump's proposing go six feet under. This doesn't. So they also had a lot of holes going underneath of them. So do these guys talk politics? I, I know that law enforcement doesn't like to talk politics too much, but did they talk to politics to you at all? So, you know, she, she's a... She's an agent for the Border Patrol right. and also media. So she knows that there are certain things she can't say. But one thing that she did say to me is that they, they do want a see-through border. I mean, they're not supposed to enforce it, but she didn't directly say she wants it because, you know, it's her, her job. But right. she kind of kept stressing the importance of having a see-through border, or at least at the bottom, which two of the prototypes are, so okay. they can see through. And I think it's really important that we do have that now after talking to her. Because I don't want our Border Patrol getting assaulted. That's not okay. Right, of So course. I think that if we do build a 30-foot wall, which is really intimidating. I was standing next to these things, just looking up. I'm like, yeah. I don't know how anybody could get over this yes. thing. Yeah. Uh, I think it should be a see-through one.
It's, it's kind of amazing to me that this thing, you know, they've turned the wall into a sort of spiritual entity. Like yeah. Barbara Streisand is making albums about walls. And, you know, it's like, how can we put walls between people? But you have walls around your house. You have walls around any place you don't want people. It just seems to make common sense. I mean, one of the things that really came off in your video was how commonsensical it is. It works for Israel. It works for Israel. I've been, yeah. I've been to the security yeah. barrier in Israel, and it's, I think yeah. it's just about the same height as, as Trump's proposal, and it worked there. Terrorism went down, what, 98% after they built it? I know we're not dealing necessarily terrorist issues. Like I said, we're terrorists caught, but it's more of an immigration crisis. But if we do build this barrier, it should be something that is effective. And we should try making it more cost efficient because the conservative me doesn't like how the prototypes cost $450,000. We should get a contractor who can do it. What is it? Ahead of schedule under budget? Yeah. So just the prototypes cost. Just the prototypes each. where Where can people see the video? You guys can see it on YouTube and you can see it on Facebook as well. And you can follow me on Twitter at Cassie Dillon and I've been sharing it like crazy. Okay. And, and Cassie, I can only apologize that the Daily Wire is filled with so many men who didn't have to. They sent you. <laughs> they sent me. <laughs> but, but you did a great job. It's a really good video. Thank I, you. I thank you for coming on. Thanks. All right. Let's go to sexual follies. I still find it's still kind of funny that they, um, sexual, violence. you know, I want to talk about the way the left has been approaching sex, especially in terms of the election. Uh, there's this one campaign from these 10 Vermont women who took off their clothes and posed naked, uh, holding up a sign in front of their private parts saying, grab them by the ballot, I guess, in reference to Donald Trump saying women will allow you to grab them if you're a celebrity. And you know, I'm always taken with the fact that the left, especially the feminist left, has come to think of female nudity as an expression of, of rage. Uh, you see this again and again, that they march with their shirts off. They, you know, I, I always joke that I, this is why I started feminism, to convince women that this would be a good idea. But, but really, it, it, it really speaks of a kind of anger about themselves, a kind of hatred of themselves. It's really, it's difficult to look on. I mean, it makes me feel sorry for them in a lot of ways. There was a writer at CNN, a woman named Wednesday Martin, Wednesday Martin, who said said that there really should be a sex strike. We should have a sex strike. And she starts off by saying the mere existence of the term, she heard the term service sex. And she says the mere existence of the term service sex Uh, suggests it is common enough to need a name. Several therapists I interviewed while researching a book about female sexuality told me that in their experience, it was a common problem for couples with women more likely to be the ones providing service with less than a smile. Now, what this means, a lot of times women jokingly call this maintenance sex, which is because men generally want more sex than women. Their uh, urges, especially in youth, are incredibly urgent. And wives find that they can take care of this uh, for them, even if sometimes they're not in the mood, they take care of their husbands because their husbands want it more. And it's just a kind of kindness that they perform from them. And it also keeps the, uh, you know, keeps the guy at home a little bit and means that he's not always walking around on the prowl. So it's not, you know, it's not a terrible thing. But she says, oh, my gosh, uh, many straight women in long term relationships may think service sex is natural. Uh, They have horny husbands and disinterested wives or recurring near an inescapable trope in pop culture. And she says, it's easy to argue that service sex is just a fancy term for being a good wife or girlfriend. The problem with this belief is that it equates female goodness with sacrificing one's sexual pleasure for someone else's, namely the person you love. A woman's woman's sex strike against service sex, uh, a refusal to do it out of sense of obligation would force us to confront these basic inequalities resetting the balance so women no longer provide service sex is not in and of itself a comprehensive answer to gendered inequalities, but making sex female-focused and female pleasure-centric could begin to force other shifts in thinking in important ways. This is such a revelatory and ugly uh, article. It really is. I mean, it's, it's, it's as if I had said to men, you know how you celebrate Valentine's Day, even though you don't really give a crap, you know? You should do it because your wife likes it, so you take her out and you get stuff. This is, you know, we, it's time for us to make holidays male-centric. It is time for us not to allow, what, what, are you, what are you doing being kind to your wife doing something that you don't want to do? That's what it's like talking about. It's as if, it's as if 
people are not in relationships at all, as if everything can be measured in material gain, in your pleasure, or in, in money. You know, it is, it's an amazing, amazing way to look at the world, and it speaks a lonely and terrible life uh, that, I, that I think is what feminism leads to. It, you know, if, as I hope there are, as I, if I hope there are, there are many, many women who uh, sometimes have sex with their husbands when their husbands need it and maybe the woman isn't in the mood because she knows that's a good thing to do both for their relationship and a kind thing to do for her husband. Boy, I hope that's out there. And if leftists are listening to this woman, I really hope they do go on strike. I hope that I, I, I recommend for all leftist women today you start a sex strike right, right away because I want to know that only conservatives are having great relationships and having fun. What a desperate, sad, sick way to look at human interactions without any kind of measurement of the affection involved, without any kind of measurement of the little sacrifices we all make for each other every day, at least I hope you make for your spouse every day. Uh, just an incredible way to look at life. It's that attitude, I feel, that haunts this election, that haunts our cultural wars, that attitude of, of meanness and smallness that measures everything by material gain and by material pleasure. And I feel it's that that is underlying the, the anger, a lot of the anger that we feel that some of us stand against that. We stand against that and we want to defend uh, the love that we have for each other, the sacrifices that we make for each other, and the little kind of comical uh, interchanges that we all have. It's a sad thing if that goes out of the world. All right, get out there, stop listening to me and get out there and vote. Or if you are standing on voting line listening to me, keep listening to me and vote. Uh, get out there and do what you got to do. But again, may foe base the do not be afraid. Everything is going to be fine. Don't panic. It'll all turn out all right in the end. I've read the book and I looked at the end and it's all great. I'm Andrew Claven. This is The Andrew Claven Show. We'll see you tonight for the Daily Wire backstage special and we'll find out what happens and we'll talk about it all tomorrow. The Andrew Clavin Show is produced by Robert Sterling. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Senior producer, Jonathan Hay. Our supervising producer is Mathis Glover. Technical producer, Austin Stevens. Edited by Alex Zingaro. Audio is mixed by Mike Cormina. Hair and makeup is by Jesua Alvera. And their animations are by Cynthia Angulo and Jacob Jackson. The Andrew Clavin Show is a Daily Wire forward publishing production. Copyright forward publishing 2018.